All right, guys, I think I'm going to go ahead and get started now. I, I hope that you can all uh, see me all right and hear me okay so far. Um, we have made it to the last uh, regular class meeting of the semester, believe it or not. I never thought it would be happening like this. <laughs> Very different than how we started off the semester, um, but we are just about there. So. Um, Today's class, uh, I'm going to talk about the final exam a little bit to kind of go over some of that stuff. Uh, we have one more section we actually need to cover, which is not too bad. It should take less than half the time. Uh, and then uh, I actually have a, uh, a little bit of a, at least a start on a review uh, that we're going to be able to talk about as well. So um, just to uh, let you know uh, what's coming up. Uh, first things first, there's one more homework assignment that will be due um, just based on this section 9.6 right here. That homework assignment is due on Saturday night. Uh, there's only two problems on the assignment. It's very short. Um, I will create a Dropbox folder for you to submit that homework to. Uh, and so you should get an email uh, about a uh, Dropbox request. Um, for that homework. So that's the last homework assignment. Once uh, you turn that in and we get it graded, I will uh, be dropping your two lowest grades this semester, uh, either two homeworks or if that one quiz that we took was your lowest, then I would drop the quiz and one of your other homeworks. So uh, I should have an updated spreadsheet with all of that information. So that's the, the end of the homework, uh, is, is this uh, one last assignment with two problems on it. Now, uh, to go over some of the things for the final, and by the way, feel free to interrupt me. Uh, if you have questions about anything uh, that I'm talking about, I'm gonna start off today at the beginning of class talking about the final exam a little bit. So if you have questions, uh, feel free to, to let me know. I'm gonna to try to cover everything that I can think of that you might have questions about, but um, let me know if, if there's any further questions that you have. I'm going to share my screen with you right now uh, so that I can show you in the background here um, this handout. Hopefully you can all see this screen that I'm sharing with you right now. This screen is on my you know, this is my final exam resources page. And so uh, over here, uh, the very first document on the left side is this final exam information sheet. And so uh, that's what uh, I was showing you. Let me just pull it back out again. Um, so uh, just to let you know, uh, I think you already know this. Our final exam is exactly next Thursday. So we have seven days to go uh, until the final. Notice the time of the final is from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. However, <laughs> just like I did with the midterms, I'm going to stretch that time a little bit because I understand the challenges of the um, remote exam, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the remote exam format. So you'll be getting the final exam emailed to you probably by about 1040, 1040, about 1040, I would say. Uh, I'll send it to you a little early. And so if you can be ready to go, you can have uh, that extra few minutes to start on the exam, okay? Also, I'm not going to stop you right at one o'clock. I'll probably let you work for an extra, actually, I might even go an extra 45 minutes uh, or something because I don't think there'll be any other finals uh, that anybody has immediately after that class. So you'll, you'll end up getting closer to three hours to work on this final, especially if you're ready to go and uh, check that email right when uh, I send it about 1040 or so, okay? So that's next Thursday. The rules will be very similar to what we've had for the midterms. I will give you that same table of annihilators and integrals again that we had uh, on Tuesday. I'll give that to you again on the final. You'll also be given the Gram-Schmidt formulas. If you might remember from chapter five when we were talking about 
orthogonalizing a set of vectors, uh, these Gram-Schmidt formulas are what help us to do that. So I'll be giving you those formulas just like I did on the second midterm that we took back in March. I'll also, I didn't say it here, but I'm going to give it to you. I will also give you the formula for the mixing problems. You might remember when you have um, a beaker or a tank that has a solution of chemicals in it and you pour chemicals in and you leak chemicals out, there's a differential equation that governs the amount of chemical in that tank at any given time. This is in section 1.7. And I will give you that formula as well because it's something we haven't used in a long time and it's fairly complicated, okay? So, um, but anyway, other than that, uh, again, no calculator, no books, no notes, nothing like that. So just the, the table of integrals and annihilators, the Gram-Schmidt formulas and the mixing formulas, okay? I'm gonna talk about the review sessions in just a second. Uh, notice that starting on Saturday, I'm going to have office hours, at least some hours every single day, all the way until our exam next Thursday. So um, you can, you don't have to write these all down, of course, this is all just from this handout, but um, kind of be aware that I'm going to be available. And I understand that this has been a very trying time to try to learn math uh, remotely. Uh, but I am going to be in those Zoom office hours a lot. And if you need me to go over something again, or you just have any confusions or questions about anything over these basically six days in a row, uh, you'll be able to talk to me about them and I'll be glad to help you out. Okay. Uh, it will be a comprehensive final. Um, I may put a little bit of emphasis on chapter nine. Okay. Um, notice we haven't even talked about 9.6 yet. Uh, that section will almost certainly be on the final uh, because this section, as we're going to see, involves putting a lot of things together. So I'll probably ask you something from this section that we're going to do in a few minutes for sure. Uh, and I might hit chapter nine a little bit heavier anyway, uh, just because on the last midterm, I think. Um, couple of those questions about linear systems of differential equations. Um, I could tell people maybe need to really solidify that a little bit more. So I'm going to really ask people to make sure they're, they're on top of that. Okay. Um, so uh, I've got some suggestions here for how to study. You know, you can go over your lecture notes, but don't go so slowly through them that it's like some long thing that takes three, four days. That's that's gonna take too much of your time. So you can just get a feeling for the topics again by kind of glancing through those notes. Um, you know, maybe there'll be certain things about the notes you wanna look at a little more carefully, but I wouldn't go through it line by line as if you've never seen this stuff before because that's gonna be, um, that's gonna be too much. Uh, you know, it's gonna take you too long to be able to do the other things. Okay, uh, I would suggest reviewing the group works. I say it right there at, the, at that second bullet point. Um, there's about 16 group works and they're all posted uh, and the solutions are all posted. So you might wanna uh, go back and, and do some of those again or at least look at them again. Um, and then try some new problems on your own. This could be the sample final that I have posted. And also there's some practice problems in this review packet, uh, if we scroll down a little bit, you'll see there's some more practice problems there. So it's always good to try new problems. Uh, try something you haven't quite seen before just to get a little more variety and to test yourself to see how you're doing um, taking a, a brand new problem, you know, kind of out of the blue and see if you can figure out how to solve it. Okay. Um, Let's see, uh, on the exam itself, uh, you know, it, there's nothing wrong with skipping over something and coming back to it later. Just like I did on the midterm that we took on Tuesday, I'm probably gonna give you some free choices, right? Uh, I'll probably end up dropping some question, you know, or maybe I'll let you skip something, um, you know, so there'll be some chances to do that. I, I never expect perfection. 
on my exams. And so I don't want you to put all that stress on yourself. If you come to a question that you're not sure how to do, right? The best thing to do is to just let it go. Try the next problem instead and maybe the next problem after that and move forward through the exam and then come back later. Don't get so bogged down and so stressed out by one problem because it probably, you know, is going to be the case that everybody's going to have something on the exam where it's like, oh gosh, I don't quite remember. I need to, I need to think about this and focus on it a little bit. Nothing wrong with that at all. Okay. Um, yeah. And so then, like I said, I do have some extra practice problems down here at the bottom. So you'll be able to, um, practice a little bit more on some of these topics. These are mostly from chapters eight and nine right here. So uh, just something else to kind of uh, keep in mind, okay? So let me uh, go back over to here. The solutions to all of those practice problems that I was just highlighting, they're over here in this document on the right side up at the top, okay? So you can certainly um, check your answers on any of those problems. Uh, if we scroll down a little bit, you see I do have a sample final and the solutions to the sample final. Try not to look at the solutions though until after you really tried to take the exam. Okay, so I would wait a few days. I wouldn't take the sample exam immediately. <clears throat> it, give yourself a chance to study a little bit first and then see if you can just sit down and try the sample test. Uh, and just see how it goes. Uh, and you can check your answers here. Uh, and that'll give you a chance to kind of practice the feeling of what the exam is going to be like. Uh, this exam, this sample exam, I think is an exam from last year. I'll probably be writing your exam in pretty much the same format. You might notice on this sample exam that there were 160 points available, but I only graded it out of 140 points. Those are the sorts of things that I'm likely to do. This way you have a bit of a buffer, right? You come to some problem, you don't know how to do it. Well, you can still get 100%, <laughs> right? If you have to skip something, um, you know, up to a certain number of points, you know, that's understandable, okay? I also have these final exam review session questions. So normally I do a face-to-face -face review session for my final exams and I go through these problems and then the solutions are over here. So in the past, of course, when students weren't able to come to my review session, they could always still do the review session problems and just check the solutions, which are posted right here. And so that's still true. You guys can still uh, just simply try the problems out that are over here. Uh, there's maybe about, I forget, there might be about 11 of them on the two, page, two or three pages there. You can try those out and then just check the solutions on your own. The other thing you could do instead of that, however, is actually watch some of my old videos of my final exam review sessions. Now, let me explain this a little bit because it's a little bit confusing. I ended up labeling these, you see a ton of videos here, right? Oh my gosh, there's a lot of videos. The first one is actually a video from last semester. And it's about, it's, a, it's over an hour and a half of time. And um, what I've done with these videos is I've tried to give a little note about what the main topics from those videos were so that you can see what you're going to be uh, seeing problems on in these videos. You see, I didn't just do these problems from the review session handout, and I certainly didn't do them in order. I kind of mixed things up, you know, I was doing things on the fly. So I just want people to know kind of how, whoops, sorry. I want people to know how this is organized. So we have these review session questions here, and then I have videos down below. So like video A is going to be, you know, a 106 minute video that has problems from chapters one, four, and five in it. So obviously for this final exam, I decided I should review some of the older material since this is a cumulative final. So I started off by doing some problems way back in chapter one, and then some things about subspaces and inner product spaces, just because that's 
kind of older material right now. Okay. Now I also have several more videos actually from a different review session. Okay. So these were not all done in one single review session. I have to be honest with you. Unlike the review session for the midterm, which was all compiled into one three hour segment, I have a lot of short little things here. So you'll notice I have a 30 minute video and a four minute video. Why, why is it like that? Well, the reason is that because I used to not be using my iPhone to record these videos. This is before we had Zoom and everything like that. I was using a camera and my camera would only run for a certain length of time before it would just shut off and I have to start a new video. So all of the rest of these videos, video B, C, D, E, F, G, and H, they are all much shorter. They are little sections, but they do kind of go in order. So in other words, you know, the camera shuts off right in the middle of the solution to one problem. So then I just turn the camera back on and start recording a new video. Okay, so I hope this is not gonna be too confusing for you. It, it shouldn't be. Um, hopefully, like if you just go in order, it'll be no problem. I should notice that video B, you might even want to start with video B because these two segments, which are 30 minutes and then an extra four minutes at the end, they are just an overview of the first five chapters. So they're basically going back and reviewing the material for the first two midterms. Okay. But I didn't actually solve any problems in these two videos here. Okay. The, the videos that are solving the problems are going to be video A up here, and then all of the rest of the ones down below, okay? So you can see that, you know, for example, video C is 24 minutes. Video D, I kind of put this together into a 13 and a 21 minute section. And just with little descriptions about what types of problems I was solving in these videos, okay? I hope this kind of makes sense. Of course, the other thing you can do is you can go back to the review packets for all of the midterms, and you're going to find videos from those review sessions that you can rewatch again. You can go back to your, you know, I would suggest that, you know, if you didn't do well on one of the midterms, you might want to go back to the resources. You know, you can go back up here. Let's say you didn't feel very good about the second midterm or something. I would go back to that set of resources and review all of this stuff again, including the videos. If you want to, you can rewatch any of those videos uh, from earlier in the semester. So my point is that everything that we've done all semester long is still up here on the website. And so you don't just have these final exam resources to look at, you actually have everything of the resources for all of the midterms as well, okay? For some of you, if you did really well on the third test that we just took on Tuesday, you may not need to spend that much time looking at the recent material. Maybe for you, uh, you want to spend more time going back to the first two exams and the older stuff, okay? So you can find the things that are relevant for what you need to review. Maybe you didn't do very well on the third exam compared to what you were hoping. Well, this would be a chance to kind of go back and rehash that stuff again and see if you can do a little bit better on it next time, okay? I think I'll go ahead, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a minute. Um, okay, so I've been talking for a little bit here. Ryuko is asking me, do we need to remember Newton's law of cooling formula? The answer to that is yes. I do want you to know Newton's law of cooling. You'll see me talking about it in those review session videos that I was just highlighting. So that one is a pretty straightforward equation um, and I don't think it should be too bad for you. Remember, it's a separable first order differential equation. So you just solve it by separating the variables and integrating on both sides. Okay, so I've tried to go over kind of all of those resources that are on my website for you guys. Are there any questions so far about how the exam is going to work and what your 
resources are going to be to practice from. So far, so good. So there, there's, in some ways, guys, there's almost too much stuff, right? Notice I did not suggest that you go back and redo all the homework. <laughs> That's not gonna happen, right? You have to go for the highlights, the things that have been the most important. Um, group works often highlight those important things, right? So going back to the group works is something that's more manageable and that focuses on the things that are the most important. Looking at an old sample final is another great way to see sort of what I thought was important enough to ask about on a final exam in a past semester. And those are the kinds of things that, that you're going to want to look at, right? Uh, I'm probably going to write a final that is similar to what you've already seen in the sample final. And you kind of know my style by now, kind of how I write my exams, okay? While I'm thinking about it, um, as you know, I already returned your um, results on your third midterm. And um, of course, the solutions to that midterm are posted. Uh, the results were very similar, <clears throat> excuse me, they were very similar to the results from the first two exams. I did go back and, you know, of course, I added a few points to everybody's score <clears throat> to kind of bolster the grades up. If you look at your, uh, at, sorry, if you look at the grade sheet that I have posted for this class, it is totally up to date right now. Uh, it's just missing the last couple of homework assignments and, and of course the final exam that we haven't taken yet, but it's pretty well up to date. Remember that your grade though is actually a little bit higher than what it says on my website. And that's because <clears throat> I'm going to reweight the grade. I'm gonna add 5% weight to whatever the best part of your grade is and take away 5% weighting to whatever the weakest part of your grade is, right? And when I do that shuffling, which I won't be able to do until after the final, it tends to bump everybody up about 3% or so. So your grade is a little higher than what it says on, online. Um, but if you go way over to the far right column of the grade sheet, you'll see what my, um, grade curve is and that is not going to i'm not going to change those percentages so you know to get a certain grade like for example to get a b minus you have to have a 75 percent that's not going to change so uh, when people are asking do i curve the course grades i already have that curve with the percentages that you need to reach a certain level that I don't like to change what that curve is, but what I will do is, you know, like I did with the third midterm, I added some points to everybody's exam, right? <laughs> so I didn't just take your raw score of how many points you earned. I added four points to everybody's test, and then I also added extra points for whichever problem you kind of lost the most points on. And, you know, I, I bolstered the scores up enough to where it fit into my curve, right? So that's the way I like to do it. I don't change my curve. What I do is change your scores, <laughs> uh, right? And I, I would only move them upward. I would never move them downward, okay? So, so that's kind of how I'm, I'm going to handle that. But do take a look at how you're doing. If you have concerns going into this final, um, Feel free to stop by my Zoom office hours. We can certainly talk um, and try and try and see maybe what we could do differently to help get you ready for the final. I know it's been tough. You haven't been able to get together with your friends as easily to study. Um, watching old review sessions uh, is probably not as good as actually coming to McCarthy Hall and hearing it straight from me. Uh, so I understand it's been it's been definitely challenging. Um, I really appreciate you guys hanging in there with me on this. And for the most part, I feel like people have been doing fairly well. Um, yet to some extent, I have to be honest, you know, to some extent, 
the basic algebra, for example, factoring an auxiliary equation or finding the eigenvalues of a matrix, these things really only involve high school math. You just have to like factor an equation, but sometimes that can be a real issue, right? If somehow it gets factored wrong, what ends up happening is it's very hard to get the rest of the problem right. And I know that that happened to some of you on the third midterm. And I, you know, I was feeling bad as I was grading some of those because I'm like, I bet this person knows what they're supposed to do, but they got the wrong lambdas or something like that, right? <laughs> and, you know, it's hard for me to, to know what to say because I can't tell you, well, you should have studied for another 100 hours right? That's not going to be the difference between whether you can factor a polynomial or not, right? So, so to some extent, those things are kind of beyond everybody's control. Um, I liked how many of you on the third midterm, if you, if you did get stuck, you tried to write down the fragments of the ideas of what you did know how to do. And that was great because I was able to give you some partial points at least for saying, okay, this person understands what tools to use, but they're playing with the wrong numbers and so it's not going to work out, <laughs> right? This can happen to anybody. It's happened to me, right? Before even solving my own exam sometimes, if I get you know, a little too lazy, I can make a mistake and suddenly it becomes impossible to solve or I get an integral that I just cannot do or something like that. So try not to let that part of it stress you out. Your job is to make sure you know the content and know what tools you have to solve the problems and when to use which tool. And if you tell me those things on your exam, I will do everything I can to give you the points that I can give you for at least for that much information, okay? But you also have to get some sleep at some point. You can't just like say, well, I'll just study for 500 hours, then I'll be fine, right? It doesn't work that way, <laughs> right? We have, to, we have to pace ourselves a little bit and um, you know, be good to our bodies. I know you have other classes as well. So um, you know, just, just try to you know, just chill a little bit about it. Um, and, and, and I think You'll, you'll find that you're a little bit happier with the whole process over these next seven days, okay? Um, let me think. Does anybody have any questions? I know I've been talking for a while uh, about the, the final and about the grading and the reviewing and everything. Are there any, any concerns or questions about any of that so far? Okay, hearing none, I hope, I'm, I hope everybody's out there alive and well and, <laughs> and hearing me all right. I think what I'm going to do next is I'm going to try to cover this section right here. And we're going to cover section 9.6, and then I'm going to do uh, a group work. We're going to do it together as a class right here. We're going to do a group work to start reviewing for the final after that, okay? So just one last section that we need to cover uh, and we'll be done with the syllabus for 250B. So this is it. <laughs> it's section 9.6. The topic is non-homogeneous linear systems of differential equations. And so in this box right here, I sort of wrote down what a non-homogeneous linear system of differential equations would look like. The main thing is it's, you know, x prime equals ax, that should look familiar, but I'm gonna now be adding this plus b here. b is a vector, and let's assume in this section that b is not zero anymore, okay? That's why this is non-homogeneous, okay? And then what we're gonna try to do is figure out how to solve this system. It turns out that it follows a very similar progression to, what we learned actually in the last chapter. So this is gonna look somewhat familiar. So we will solve, we solve for x using something called variation of parameters. 
So this is also called variation of parameters. So this is called variation of parameters, just like we learned in chapter eight. And it's a three step process here. So I'm gonna outline the three steps. I'm just gonna outline what the three steps are first, and then we'll uh, go, through the, go through it with an example. So the first one, this is gonna sound very familiar, okay? We're going to solve the corresponding homogeneous linear system, okay? So solve, step one, solve the corresponding homogeneous system. Of course, that system is just x prime equals a x. Okay, so the, the homogeneous system means you just forget about the b part. So x prime equals a x, and you solve that for what is called the complementary function, okay? So I'm gonna just write it here as x sub c of t. So this is a vector solution, x sub c of t. This is step one, is to solve this system. Remember, we've already learned how to do that, right? We find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a, right? We create our solutions out of those eigenpairs, okay? And we addressed, you know, what happens if the matrix is defective or if the eigenvalues are complex numbers. Any of those kind of things could happen. But in sections 9.4 and 9.5, we learned how to do all of this, okay? So you have to make sure you know how to do all of that. And then the second step is where we are going to find find one particular solution one particular solution this one is called x sub p of t okay one particular solution to our actual system here so the system is x prime equals x prime equals a x plus b okay and in your notes you might want to just write c below because i'm going to explain how to do that in a minute okay and then uh, finally the third step is step three is to just write down the final answer And for the final answer, of course, that's just going to be x of t equals x sub c of t plus x sub p of t. Okay? This should look pretty familiar. Three steps, right? Step one, solve the corresponding homogeneous linear system. Step two, we're gonna find one particular solution. And then step three, we're just gonna write this down as our final answer. And guys, for the final exam, if you don't want to rewrite this third step in full express, in the, with the full expressions for the, for the two terms here, as long as you circle, as long as you circle your complementary function and your particular solution, and you've got those on your paper, you can just write this equation at the end and I'll give you the credit for that, right? You don't have to recopy it. It just takes extra time to do that, okay? So most of what's up on this board, we are already good with, right? Right, we know how to solve the corresponding linear system. Step three looks like a no-brainer. We're just writing down the answer. It's just step two that we have to talk about. How do we get one particular solution to the system? And it's by a method called variation of parameters again. 
So it's, it's actually kind of reminiscent of that. Okay, so if everybody's good, I'm gonna erase this. I am re recording today's lecture. So as usual, you'll have a chance to come back and, and look at this again if you need to. Let's talk about step two. Clear this off for a moment, and then we'll do that. Okay, so for step two, Right? For step two, in order to get this, uh, the, the notation to work, let me just uh, write down, first of all, what the complementary function is going to look like. So this would have been from step one. So you have the complementary function, which is x sub c of t. And the way that would look the form of this would be, you know, a linear combination. So it's going to be like C1, X1 of T plus C2, X2 of T plus dot, dot, dot plus CN times XN of T. Okay. So the n, by the way, would be the size of the, of the linear system. So if it's an n by n matrix, you would have n basis vectors here, right? So the basis vectors are the x1, the x2, x3, and so on, right? And now we're just forming a linear combination of those to get our complementary function. So again, this is called the complementary function. Okay, Okay. so that's all from step one, right? But we're going to need that notation when I start to explain how to do step two right here. Okay, before I do that, you might notice that we can rewrite the right-hand side of this equation a little bit differently, right? What we can do is we can write this as the following matrix. I'm going to put my x1, my x2, and so on into the columns of a matrix all the way up to xn. So x1, so these we're just laying our uh, solutions that we got in step one into the columns of this matrix, and we right multiply that by the column of the constants C1, C2, C3, all the way down to Cn. When you, when you take this matrix here, when you take this matrix and you write multiply it, okay, so you guys remember how to do matrix multiplication. You go across the rows of the first matrix and down the, the column here. When you do that, what you'll notice is that the C1 over here, right? This C1 only touches the X1. It's exactly C1 times X1 because C1 is the first entry in this column. And so it's only going to be multiplying the entries from the first column of the matrix as we go across and down, okay? This is just reconfiguring the equation at the top as a matrix. You might remember that when you put your basic solutions into the columns of a matrix, this matrix had a special name. And I don't know if any of you remember it. I didn't ask you about it on the midterm. But just to remind you what this is, this matrix right here, this matrix is called the fundamental matrix. It is called a fundamental matrix. It is the matrix whose columns are the solutions to your homogeneous linear system of differential equations. Okay, so these are just your solutions from step one. You lay them into the columns of this matrix and you get what we call the fundamental matrix. I'm going to denote that fundamental matrix by capital X. 
and the column of the constants is just the vector c. Okay, so this is all just notation, <laughs> and we haven't really done step two yet. I just sort of wanted to get set up to, to, to now explain step two. Okay, so for step two, we will, one last time in Math 250B, we are going to guess the form of the particular solution. So we will, we will guess, we are gonna make a guess for what x sub p of t is going to be. There are two formulas in this section that you guys need to learn, just two. And this is the first one, okay? And what it is, is it simply capital X times U. So you remember variation of parameters back in chapter eight? We had some constants, you know, in the complementary function, C1, Y1 plus C2, Y2. What did we do when we wanted to guess the particular solution? We changed C1, Y1 plus C2, Y2 into U1, Y1 plus U2, Y2. And that's exactly what we're going to do here. Do you see? I'm just changing my constant vector into a vector here, which is u. And now I'm just going to say where u is to be determined. OK, so where u is to be determined. So this is the first formula. There's two formulas. I'll make sure to put them both in boxes. This is the first one that you're going to need to know um, to do the problems in section 9.6. The particular solution is just the fundamental matrix. That's this guy right here, right? Which we can actually get from step one. It's that fundamental matrix times u where u is to be determined. Now, how are we going to determine what u is? Well, we're going to take our guess and plug it into our linear system. Let's do that, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to plug we're going to plug this x sub p into x prime equals ax plus b. So notice that I'm now actually considering the full non-homogeneous system. Okay? So let's just do this. I think I have enough room right on the bottom of the board, I hope I do, <laughs> um, to, to squeeze this in here for you. Okay, let's just figure out what happens. So when I plug x of p into this box of this non-homogeneous linear system, on the left side, I have to take the derivative of it. So in other words, I'm going to be taking the derivative of this product. That's going to be the product rule, right? So what are we going to get on the left side? We're going to get x times u prime plus x prime times u, right? This is just the product rule of my guess that I'm plugging into my left side of my equation here. On the right side, I have a times x, but the x vector is x times u plus b. OK? So I'm just plugging in everywhere I see the x in this linear system, I'm replacing it with capital X times u. OK. Now, the thing is that <clears throat> We, we already know that, uh, let me come back up here, give myself a little more room. You know, as usual, we're gonna be checking, we're gonna be matching the left side to the right side. This is the way we normally would do something like this, right? So the thing is, what do we get if we figure out, so just as a quick note here, what is a x? Right, what is that? 
Well, if you think about it, that's just A times X1, X2, dot, 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 these columns here, right? We're just putting the, the fundamental matrix column by column, that's how it looks. And I can distribute the A into those columns now. So I can just literally figure this out by doing AX1, and then the next column is AX2, column by column, it's gonna break down like that, AXN, and you end up with something like that. So you just multiply the matrix A through the whole thing. But remember that, you know, X1 right here and X2, these were solutions to the homogeneous system, right? So AX1 is just X1 prime. And AX2 is just X2 prime and so on. These are primes. All of these are just derivatives. In other words, it's just capital X prime. <laughs> it's just capital X prime. It's just the derivative of the fundamental matrix. So notice that AX is the same as X prime. Step by step, I hope each equal sign makes sense to all of you, right? The first equal sign, I'm just replacing X with the fundamental matrix. The second equal sign, I'm just multiplying capital A by the fundamental matrix, column by column. And then I'm just using the fact that each of these columns is already supposed to match up with step one, which was the homogeneous linear system. And if you take the derivative of every single column of a matrix, you may as well just write that as the derivative of the whole matrix. Every single slot of the matrix is being differentiated. Now, why is that note going to help me down here? Well, here's AX, right? So if we believe the note, the note says that AX is just X prime. Ah, there's also X prime over here. And notice this is X prime times U. And this term is actually just X prime times U also. I can actually cancel. Okay, so let me write that here. Canceling AX equals X prime we get a simpler equation now, which is capital X times U prime equals B. You see that? Here's capital X times U prime, and here's B. Remember, why, why am I, what am I doing here? <laughs> I'm trying to figure out what U is right? Well, this is the equation that I'm currently looking at right here. X times U prime is equal to B. Now, does that tell me anything? I'm going to go ahead and erase up here at the top. You may remember from uh, a week or so ago, this fundamental matrix, capital X, is invertible. It's an invertible matrix. That's because the columns of that matrix, capital X, right? Remember, capital X is literally just this matrix. These columns are the linearly independent solutions to the homogeneous system. And if a matrix has linearly independent columns, <laughs> it's invertible, right? This capital X is invertible. There is an X inverse out there. And I'm going to use that X inverse right now to solve for U prime. I'm going to invert this matrix X, basically throw it to the other side of the equal sign, and it's going to be capital X inverse times B if we solve for U prime. And so therefore, U itself is just the integral of capital X inverse times B 
And this formula is the second formula in this section that you need to learn. Remember I said there were two. There's this one right here. We have to know what the particular solution should be for a guess. We're gonna guess that it's capital X times U, where U is to be determined. And now I'm telling you that we have actually figured out what U is. U should be the integral. We do have to do an integration here. U is the integral of the inverse of the fundamental matrix multiplied by B. If you know these two box formulas, you can do any problems from, from this section. So I'd like to do an example. I will almost certainly put one of these on the final. Uh, you're gonna get, we're gonna do one example right now. Uh, there's at least another example in the videos from the review sessions. And you're gonna do two homework problems and you're probably gonna find one in the sample final. So by the time we've gotten to our final next Thursday, I bet you'll have seen and thought through at least five or six of these, okay? So let's do one of them right now uh, to practice. I'm gonna erase this board, but keep these two boxes in a close reach because these are the two equations that you need to be able to do the problems in this section, okay? That's all there is to it. There's no, there's no other heavy theory here. It's not particularly conceptual. What makes this hard is just that it's a lot of steps. This is a big process. I know, I know I listed it as three steps, but each of those steps, at least the first two steps, each take a fair bit of work. So uh, let's practice. We'll do a practice and then, uh, and then we'll take a break. And then after the break, we'll just be reviewing at that point. Are there any questions so far? Everybody hanging in there? <laughs> okay, let's do an example. Let's try a practice problem here. So here's an example. Right? Uh, solve the following problem. Okay, so here we go. Um, X1 prime of T is equal to 2X1 minus X2. And X2 prime of T is equal to negative X1 plus 2X2 plus four e to the t. Okay. This is an example of where I didn't give it to you in matrix form to begin with. So the first thing I would do here on this example is I would try to rewrite it in the matrix form. So the x1 prime, x2 prime is just the x vector prime. So just gonna make it into a vector on the left. And then you see the, the two by two matrix here, right? You can see it, right? You've got basically two, negative one, negative one, two times X. So again, this, is, this X vector is really a column that has X1 and X2 in that column. And so it exactly gives you this little two by two uh, part of the system here. But don't forget about, this is the non-homogeneous term over here, this, um, this 4e to the t. So I'm gonna put that into an, a vector explicitly. And I notice that the, the first equation has no non-homogeneous part to it. So I put a zero for that, but then in the second slot, I've got 4e to the t, okay? So here is my matrix. And this over here is my B vector. So this is my system, right? X prime equals AX plus B. That's what we're looking at. So far so good? Okay, let's start working through it, okay? 
let's start working through it. And I'm going to need to erase this board probably at least a couple times. It's just not a very big board for a, a long problem like this. So just keep your notes going so you can keep looking back up at what, uh, what you've written down because I'm not going to be able to keep it all up here. Let's start with step one, which I will do fairly quickly. Step one is where we solve the corresponding homogeneous linear system. So I'm not going to worry about the B right now. I just ignore that part. And the very first thing I have to do is find the eigenvalues. Remember, right? So when you have a linear system like this, x prime equals ax, the eigenvalues of the matrix are the key. So we're gonna, we're gonna start with that. So we take the determinant of the matrix that we get, we're gonna subtract lambda off of the main diagonal. And when we do that, we're going to get uh, two minus lambda quantity squared minus one. And if I just go ahead and multiply that out, I'll have lambda squared minus four lambda plus three. And that actually factors as lambda minus three times lambda minus one. So this one is very nice. Um, it just factors very easily. Of course, this matrix, you never know, it could have been defective or it could have had complex eigenvalues. All of those harder issues that sometimes come up, they can still come up. On this example, though, they are not uh, coming up at all. So we get uh, lambda equals three uh, and lambda equals one. So let me start with lambda equals three. Can you guys all kind of see, if I subtract three, so I'm gonna do the null space here. If I subtract three from the main diagonal, I'm gonna get a matrix of all negative ones down here. As usual, I'm going to cross off a row and I'm gonna use my little switch trick that uh, came up on the midterm and, and I hope everybody's got the hang of how this works. I'm not going to go to the trouble of setting up free variables and back substituting. I'm just gonna take these two numbers, which in this case are the same, I'm gonna swap them, and then I'm gonna change one of the signs of one of them. So I'm going to go ahead and I'll leave the minus one there and put a one down there, okay? So that's my eigenvector. And then we also have lambda equals one. That's my other eigenvalue. So for this one, we take the null space of, I'm gonna do this fairly quickly. I'm just gonna subtract one from the main diagonal. So I get the matrix one, negative one, negative one, and one. And as before, I can cross off a row. I have to be able to cross off a row, right? That's always gotta be possible. And then my eigenvector this time is just going to be one, one. Okay, so with that in mind, I'm going to come back up here and write down my solutions here. We'll figure out what we've got so far. So we've got, you know, the first solution, x1 of t, that one is going to be e to the 3t times negative 1, 1. And we also have x2 of t, which is e to the t times 1, 1. This is all review, right? This is all going back to earlier in chapter 9 so far. We're still on step 1. Step 1 is the old material. We're just practicing it again on a fairly easy one. Now, from there, I can write down the complementary function, x sub c of t, right? So it's just c1 e to the 3t times negative 1, 1, plus c2 e to the t times 1, 1. Okay, so there you, there you have it, right? So that's step one. That's the complementary function. Everybody with me so far? 
Okay, let's, let's go on to step two. Step two is the new material. This is where we are doing the stuff from 9.6 right here, step two. So let's just remember right away that the uh, x sub p of t, this is one of the two main equations, it's capital X times U, okay? And this is where U is the integral of capital X inverse times B, okay? So I'm putting the two important equations that we've learned today right here in these boxes at the start of step two. As you can see, the fundamental matrix plays a very important role here. Maybe we should write it down, okay? So the fundamental matrix, remember how this works. Uh, the columns, the columns of this matrix are just the, you know, the X1 and the X2. So the first column of capital X is just this first solution up here at the top. I'm gonna multiply the E to the 3T inside the vector. And when I do that, I can make a column, which is negative e to the 3t and e to the 3t. That's the first column of the fundamental matrix. The second column of the fundamental matrix is just e to the t, e to the t. So in other words, I just multiply the e to the t into the vector 1, 1 and write it down here. Okay. That's the fundamental matrix. Now, what we need to do though is figure out cap, uh, figure out what u is, and that means I need x inverse. Okay, so guys, if you're all listening to me very closely, I won't ask you to do one of these problems for anything larger than two by two, because right now we have to take the inverse of this matrix, and that's hard to do for a larger matrix, especially when the entries are not numbers. They're, they're functions, right? Finding the inverse of a large matrix is in and of itself already a big job. But fortunately, I'm gonna write something down over here and this is good for review. Fortunately, we do have a wonderful formula. We have a wonderful formula for the inverse of a two by two, right? And you maybe, oh, maybe remember this one. This would be good to review for the final because you may be able to use this uh, very easily on the final. One over AD minus BC, right? And then I don't know if you remember, this goes back to February or whatever. To get the entries of the inverse, we swap the diagonals. So the A and the D get swapped. And then we put minus signs on the other two entries, but we leave them in the same positions, okay? So I am going to apply that generic formula right now to capital X. I'm gonna do it right here. X inverse is supposed to be one over, I have to take AD minus BC. So AD is actually negative E to the 4T and BC is also E to the 4T. If we subtract that, we end up with negative two e to the 4t, okay? And then I'm going to swap the diagonal entries. So e to the t goes up here, negative e to the 3t goes down there. This is a minus here. And then I'm gonna leave the other two entries where they are, but I'm gonna put minus signs on them. Okay, so this is this is x inverse, just using the formula for the inverse of a two by two, okay? I will only ask you two by two. So this will be something you can always use at this stage of the solution. Once you've got your fundamental matrix, you just take the inverse right here, okay? Hopefully so far so good. I'm gonna erase this generic formula over here so that I can keep writing a little bit more. If you notice inside this integral, we have to take x inverse and multiply it by b. Let's do that part next, right? 
So x inverse times b. Here's x inverse right here. Let me recopy it really quickly. Um, so it's 1 over negative 2e to the 4t times e to the t, negative e to the t. Sorry, I'm just recopying this uh, x inverse that we just worked out. OK, so there's x inverse. And I have to multiply that now by b. See the b right here? I have to multiply by b. If you go back to the top of the problem, you'll see that b was 0 and e to the 4t. OK, so this is what we have. So let's keep going. I'm going to leave this uh, coefficient out in front, negative 1 over 2e to the 4t. And now I'm just going to multiply this matrix out. Right, so we just have to do that carefully here. Zero and then minus four e to the two t. That's the top entry, negative four e to the two t. I'm just doing matrix multiplication. And then on the bottom row, I have zero and then minus four e to the four t. Okay. And that can be simplified a little bit. Let me just come back over here. Okay, this can be simplified because you can, you can now cancel the one half with the fours and also cancel the minus signs. And then you can divide e to the 4t, which is the scalar here in front. You can just divide that underneath each of these entries. So what you should get if you do all of that is e to the negative 2t on top and we should get, I'm sorry, not quite. That should be two, sorry, there should be a two e to the negative two t. And then on the bottom, we should have um, just two. Okay, so I'm working on step two. And now I know this thing right here, this is x inverse times b right here. I have to integrate it to get u. So u is the integral of that vector. Let me write out the vector here. u is the integral of this vector. And we're just going to integrate that vector slot by slot. So the integral of 2e to the negative 2t is actually just negative of e to the negative 2t. And the integral of 2 is just 2t. I should mention that we don't have to put a plus c on these slots. Normally when you do an integral, you're always thinking there's got to be a, a plus c. But remember that we are in step two where we are trying to find one particular solution right now. So we don't have to take every possible generic choice of u, we can just pick one that works. And this one is going to work right here. Okay, is everybody comfortable with this? We know what u is now. So that's just using this equation over here in this box. The last thing we have to do is multiply our fundamental matrix by u to get our particular solution. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write that down over here, and then we're going to have it. We're almost done. Once we're done with this, we'll take a short break, OK? So let me just, uh, now let's go back and find the particular solution. We put down our fundamental matrix. Um, let me remind you what that was. That's negative e to the 3t and e to the 3t in the first column. The second column was just e to the t, e to the t. That's capital X. And I'm now going to multiply that by u u was negative e to the negative 2t and 2t. Just like that. And now we just have to multiply this out. We just have to multiply this out. So if I now multiply this out, let's see, on the top entry, we just have to be careful with the algebra here. I have a minus e to the 3t times a minus e to the negative 2t. That just simplifies down to e to the t, and then plus 2t 
E to the T. Okay, so we get that for the top slot. And then on the bottom slot, we have negative E to the T plus 2T E to the T. There's the, the particular solution. Yep, that's exactly what I've got in my notes. Okay, and so if you believe me, I've now got my particular solution and we're ready to go to step three. Okay, so this is, we should put a box around this. We should put a box around that. We have a box around the complementary function at the top. We have a box around our particular solution. And so the very last uh, thing we have to do now is write down the final answer. This is step three. Okay, step three, which is x to the t, x of t, I mean, x of t equals x sub c of t plus x sub p of t. And we can just circle that and put a box around that. And that's good enough for, for my purposes because I can see here's the complementary function up here and here's the particular solution down here. Okay, so be sure to write this down because you'll get points for that. <laughs> Even if you've had some issues with, with any of the rest of this, um, you can still get some, some points for step three, which is the easiest part. <laughs> okay, are there any questions at all about that? Of course, if I gave you initial conditions, if there were initial conditions given, you could then solve for C1 and C2 by plugging in T equals zero and setting it equal to the initial condition that you're given. So there could always be a little bit more to do, but uh, basically this is the main, main issue is getting this general solution right here. And we've done all the work that we need to for that. Okay, is everybody good with that? As I said, um, this is just the first example. There's another example in the review session questions. I even labeled in that big long list of videos that I showed you, I labeled which one of those videos to watch if you wanna see another example of this, okay? Uh, so there's that, and then there's also the homework problems that you're gonna be doing for Saturday. I'm gonna ask you to do two of these, I think one of the two actually has a defective matrix. <laughs> Talk about mixing things together. Um, but it's only a two by two, and it's just a defective matrix that you have to do those W's with. Remember that? The W1 plus T times W2. So some of that stuff comes into it. So, okay, guys, let's take just a few minutes of a break. Maybe let's take a break until 1.20, about five minutes maybe. That's enough time, hopefully. Um, if you want to stretch your legs or uh, get on um, your phone or get something to eat or whatever, uh, at about 1.20, let's come back and I'm going to start giving you uh, what I hope will be a very useful, I guess, overview of the stuff we've done, uh, at least with respect to part of the material, um, because there's a lot of stuff, right? This is a very comprehensive class. It's very cumulative. It builds on itself all the way to the end. I want to help you to get a good frame of reference for how to think about the studying, okay? So let's take a five minute break. At 1.20, uh, we'll start up again and start doing some review. So see you guys in just a couple minutes.
All right, guys, I, uh, I think that was a good short little break for me, actually. I um, think I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'll start talking again, uh, if you're within the sound of my voice. Um, actually, before I do that, I'm going to turn on the, I guess my computer is not plugged into a power source here. Let me make sure that I'm, there we go. Let me make sure I'm getting power to the computer so it doesn't die. Um, yeah, so what I'd like to do, you know, with the, the limited time that we have left today is um, start talking about the studying for the final. We already went over kind of the mechanics of it and I showed you where to find some, some resources on my website uh, over these next seven days to kind of help you uh, to prepare. Um, but I also want to actually discuss a little bit with respect to the content, how to kind of go about this, because it can be a little bit intimidating as to how to like start getting on top of everything, right? There's so much stuff we've done since January. Um, we've learned a lot, by the way. I hope you guys are proud of like how far you've come, especially in the midst of a pandemic, to be able to still um, really advance our knowledge of math, uh, specifically not just differential equations, but also linear algebra and how the two have really worked together pretty much um, for almost the entire semester. Um, it's too much for me in 30 minutes to just kind of review everything that you could possibly have to think about for the final. But, um, you know, what I could do is um, try to focus at least a little bit on some of the ideas that I think might become uh, important. Okay. So everybody, can everybody hear me? Okay. Everybody's out there and good to go. Okay. Uh, fantastic. So I'm going to focus in these next 30 minutes, mostly on differential equations. Uh, not because it's somehow more important than linear algebra, but just because I have to pick something <laughs> with the time that we have right now. And, you know, you're going to have to watch my review sessions. Please do take that almost like it's an assignment. I think for most of you, it would be a really, really good idea to watch most or all of those uh, videos. I know the quality is not as good as, you know, if I was face to face with you, but it is better than nothing. And I think that, you know, there's a fair bit of content there and some good examples to look at. So, so try to do that um, to help yourself out. But at least for right now, what I'm going to uh, talk about is more on the differential equation side of things. And you can find tons of linear algebra stuff in those review sessions, okay? So in particular, if I give you a differential equation, so if I give you a differential equation, the, the question is gonna be, what do you do with it, right? What do you do with it? So there is a, sort of a, a flow chart of questions that you might think about asking yourself. When somebody hands me a differential equation to solve, usually the first question I will ask about it is what is its order, okay? So I might ask, um, is it, whoops, that marker doesn't work, does it? Uh, I might ask, is the differential equation first order or is it higher order? I, I like to figure out like where does the where does that differential equation fall within our book, right? So the first question is, you know, what is the order? What's the order? Okay, so what's the order of the differential equation? Now, if it's first order then that means that we are talking about something that we would have learned in chapter one, okay? If it's higher order, if it's second order, third order, or higher, then it's something that we've talked about. It would have to have been from chapter, chapters eight or nine, okay? So the stuff we learned here towards the end of the semester, right? If it's a first order equation, the next thing you need to do is decide what type of first order equation. So the, the next question here is which type 
And we learned four different types, right? We learned four different types. So we learned, uh, the very first thing we learned was separable. So maybe you can separate the equation or it could be that it's linear. Okay, or it could be that it's, I'll draw another box down here. It could be Bernoulli or it could be homogeneous. This is actually homogeneous of degree zero. So I don't know if you can read that very well. Let me pull this in here a little bit. So we learned how to solve four types of first order differential equations. This is way back in January and the start of February, right? The very first thing we did this semester. So we did some group work where we practiced kind of identifying which of the four types of differential equations you know, we were looking at. We practiced trying to separate the variables. We practiced recognizing whether something was linear or Bernoulli or homogeneous, right? And in each case, there's, a, there's some things you have to learn, okay? And I'm not going to be able to go through and review all of it right this very second, right? For example, with the Bernoulli equation, right? There's a change of variables that you have to know. And then you also have to know what the new differential equation becomes after you change variables, right? Um, same thing with homogeneous. There's a change of variables in there that you have to know the formula for. And then you have to remember that a homogeneous equation always becomes separable. So I'll just remind you here, homogeneous equations always become separable. Bernoulli equations always become linear when you change those variables. But you've got to be able to recognize them, right? You've got to recognize what's linear, what's Bernoulli, what's homogeneous. Separable ones, usually it's just algebra to get the variables onto opposite sides of an equal sign, okay? So this was all on the first midterm. It was on that quiz that we took uh, back in class, back in February. And uh, that's what you're gonna to want to make sure you review from chapter one, okay? So if it's a first order equation, we say, which of the types is it? And here are the four types that we learned. If I was gonna ask you any other first order differential equation, right? It really wouldn't be a fair question because we didn't study it, right? So if I wanted to ask you about some other type of first order differential equation, I would have to give you guidance in the test itself, on the question itself to say, well, oh, this is a different type of equation, so why don't you solve it by doing this approach? And I might even break it down for you, right? That's not something you can really study for though, right? You don't know, I mean, there's so many types of differential equations out there, right? You can't possibly go home and study more than even what I've taught you in this class. So don't do that, right? Make sure you know these four types really, really well, and that should be that should be good for at least this part of the flow chart. Okay. Now, on the other hand, if the differential equation is higher order, then there are some additional questions we're going to ask over on this side of the flow chart. So one thing that we might want to ask is, is it just one differential equation or is it a system of more than one differential equation? So if it is just a single one, I'll just say scalar differential equation, that's a possibility. Or it's also a possibility that we're talking about a linear system. A system, of course, would be more than one unknown function, more than one differential equation, okay? A single scalar differential equation, this is gonna, of course, be coming out of chapter eight, and the linear systems, of course, we learned about those in chapter nine. 
okay? So uh, that kind of breaks that part of it down. Now, if it's one scalar differential equation, then, you know, we have to figure out how to, how to solve it. Um, and it could be that it's, if it's non-homogeneous, that we've learned a couple of different methods for how to solve this. So it could be that we need to use annihilators. So annihilators or the other method that we learned was variation of parameters. Okay. So these are the, the two main tools that we learned for handling, you know, non-homogeneous differential equations. Some people on the midterm on Tuesday were not using the right method. Okay, there is no annihilator for the square root of x, for instance. This is the one that was on the test. And people were trying to use annihilators on that when in fact that problem was supposed to be done with uh, variation of parameters. So the, the, the decision between whether to use annihilators and variation of parameters is very important. If you know how to annihilate the capital F that's on the right side of your differential equation here, then sure, the annihilator method should be good to go. If you don't know how to annihilate that function, then you need to hope that maybe we can do variation of parameters, which is a totally different method. The only thing is variation of parameters, we only learned how to do it for second order differential equations, right? So it better only be a second order differential equation if you're gonna use this method. <laughs> okay, and make sure you remember the, the formulas for the, you know, so, this one has some formulas you need to know. U1 equals negative the integral of Y2 times capital F all over the Ronskian, right? And then there's a similar formula for U2, which is positive the integral of Y1 times F all over the Ronskian, okay? So the U1 and then the U2, and then the whole idea there is now you can write down the particular solution u1 y1 plus u2 y2. Okay, so um, variation of parameters is a pretty simple procedure, but just the only thing is you have to know when you're supposed to use it, right? It's for a second order differential equation when you cannot annihilate the function. Okay, so there was one of those on the midterm and most people actually, I think got a little bit intimidated maybe by part A or part B of the question because when they got to part C, they weren't on the right wavelength of using this uh, variation of parameters method. For the annihilators, of course, you have a table that I'm gonna give you. Uh, so you'll be able to look up those annihilators again, okay? If we have a linear system over here, yeah, you know, there's still some more things we can ask, you know, can ask, is it, is it uh, homogeneous or is it not homogeneous? Okay, put this up here a little closer for you guys. So it could be homogeneous or it might not be homogeneous. If it's not homogeneous, that's the stuff we were just learning in 9.6. Yeah, that's what you would be using for that. If it's homogeneous, we could actually, we could even break that down and say, is it non-defective? I'm really running out of room here. Is it non-defective or is it defective? Right, and so you could break it down into those two scenarios. A non-defective matrix, well, that's mostly talked about in 9.4 when the coefficient matrix is not defective. And 9.5 is where we learned how to do the W's. W1, W2, and in the super defective case, W3, 4, and 5. A lot of people did a good job on those, by the way, on the exam, especially the using the W's to get the, 
the particular solution to a defective system. So that was, that was really good to see. Remember, there's several cases of defective, right? There's super defective. There's, um, I think I called it just regular defective. And then there's the mixed eigenvalue defective. Um, so the, on the midterm, I put the uh, super defective one. And like I said, a lot of people did a pretty good job on that. So a lot of chapter nine showing up down here. Remember guys, I may put somewhat of an emphasis, slight emphasis on the final on this chapter eight and nine again, just to really make sure people are solid on what we did towards the end of the semester. So there you see a pretty big flow chart of, I would say about half of the semester is here. To be able to do everything that's on this flow chart, you have to know about half of the material from Math 250B. Remember, there's eigenvalues and eigenvectors that come in, so, comes in over here in chapter nine, right? Um, you've got things like Ronskins, which are used to test linear independence and stuff like that, right? So that there's, there's linear algebra lurking behind a lot of the stuff, especially on this side, that, that you need to know. So I am going to, are there any questions about the flow chart? Everybody's following along pretty good with that. I'm going to do a, another screen share with you really quick. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull up a group work that I hope you can all see here on your screen now. Um, this is a group work that I usually give my students on the very last class of the semester. And uh, so I would like to talk it through with you guys right now for the next 12 minutes. The, the solutions to this group work are posted on the group works of my website. And the reason I'm mentioning that is you can see that there are, well, you can see on this group work that there are six problems. We're not gonna have time to like actually solve all six problems. But what I would like to do is I would like to practice using the flow chart to decide, right, this flowchart has everything about differential equations into it, right? I would like to decide for each of these six problems in the group work, where in the flowchart should we go? Because that is deciding what tool do we need to use to solve these problems, okay? So um, let's take a look at these kind of one by one. There's also a trick question here. There's one of these six differential equations that we didn't learn how to solve this semester. So we'll, we'll see if we can pick that one out as well. Okay, so take a look at the first one with me, part A. I don't really wanna fully solve it right now, but I'd like to think about where it would fit in the flow chart. So let's go to the top of the flow chart. The very first question says, what is the order, right? So what is the order of this differential equation? What's the highest number of derivatives that we have here? Any ideas? What's the order of the differential equation? Sorry, just a second. Oh, yes, it is, sorry, I didn't mean to hit that button. Uh, yeah, it is a first order differential equation. That's exactly right. So this is a first order equation. So it means we're somewhere over here, right? The equation is either separable. Okay, let me, let me actually write the equation down on the board here at the top. So this is y minus x dy dx equals three minus two x dy dx, okay? So that's the equation. I'm gonna stop sharing the screen for a moment just so I can um, come back to my flow chart for a second. So this differential equation, you guys are right, it's first order. So is it separable, is it linear, is it Bernoulli, or is it homogeneous? This would be the next thing we would have to decide. It may not be totally obvious, uh, but this one, we can actually separate all of the x's to one side and all of the y's to the other side. So for example, if I, 
if I just do, if I just subtract the y, if I just take this y right here and subtract it to the right side, and I'll keep the three there, and then I'm gonna put everything else on the left side, I'll have, so this is negative x right here times dy dx, but I'm gonna add two x dy dx, so that's going to give me x dy dx, you see? And now I can just simply divide the three minus y underneath the dy, and I can put the dx over x, you see? So you can separate this one like that. It's, it's a little bit of algebra, but this means this is separable, right? So this one is, this one is a separable equation. If you have a separable equation, the best way to solve it is by just integrating both sides. You just algebraically separate it and then you integrate it. Okay? There's no other formulas you have to really learn for that one. Okay, let's go back to my handout again. I'm going to square my. Are there any questions on that? Okay, so that's the first one. Okay, so let me go back here. So that first one, part A, is separable. And I just showed you on my whiteboard sort of how to separate it, okay? I'll let you guys do the rest of it where you actually do the integration. Again, you can practice all of these on your own. Okay, what about part B? Let's look at part B. X1 prime of T equals negative 6X1 plus X2 plus 1. And x2 prime of t equals 6x1 minus 5x2 plus e to the negative t. Where does that fit in our material? What part of the, of the semester is that having to, anything to do with? It is first order because you're taking, you know, the, the x1 prime and the x2 prime to the first order. So if I ask you what's the order, you would say it's first order. But is it is it one equation or is it a system of equations? You see, this is actually a system of equations, isn't it? We have two unknown functions. So we are way over here in, in linear systems. It's a linear system, right? It's a linear system of differential equations. It, this is the recent material. And is this linear system, is it homogeneous or is it not homogeneous? You have to look at the equation, the, the, at the two equations there, you see the, you know, on the left side, negative 6x1 plus x2 plus 1. And on the second equation for x2 prime, do you see the e to the negative t? This is non-homogeneous. That's right. This is a non-homogeneous linear system. This is the material that we were just practicing right before our break today. So this one would be solved by using section 9.6, the very, very last material from today. Again, I have the full solution typed out. So this would be, if you, if you need to review how that method works, you know, I only did one example, right? If you wanna practice this one on your own, you can do that and you can check your solutions because they're right here in the group work. Okay, is everybody comfortable with this, that this is a non-homogeneous linear system? You know, in some ways, I'm, I'm feeling like maybe my chart, you know, I probably, for higher order, I have, you know, chapter eight here, which is fine. Chapter nine actually should probably be over with first order, because it, it's a first order linear system. That's the thing, I don't wanna confuse it with chapter one, but because it's a linear system and it's first order, right, um, it would almost make more sense if I had put it on the other side of the, of the picture. This is a very big flow chart. It's not really a perfect way to put it together, but that's, uh, that's just something to think about. Okay, let's go back to the uh, next one on the handout here, it, unless there's any questions so far. I just wanna talk through these, we're not gonna solve any of these in detail right now. 
Take a look at part C. Okay, on part C, can somebody tell me uh, is the, what is the order of this differential equation on part C? What's the highest number of derivatives that you see? It's first order, right? Yeah, it's absolutely first order, exactly. So, and is it a system of differential equations or is it one scalar differential equation? It doesn't look like part B, does it? Part B, you have both an x1 prime and x2 prime. But on part C, all I have there is just y prime. So that's just one unknown function. It's first order. So we're talking about chapter one again. Okay, so we're back over here on the, on the lower left corner of, of this, uh, of this uh, spreadsheet here. Okay, um, so if, if we look over here, we've got four choices, right? Separable, linear, Bernoulli, or homogeneous. Looking at this equation, let me pull it back up again. Which of those four types do you think this one would be? Does anybody have a thought about that? You know, whenever I see y over x, I tend to get a little bit um, suspicious because y over x is actually the change of variables that we're supposed to use for the homogeneous case right here. See, if we take that equation on part C and we solve it for y prime, let me see if I can kind of do that really quickly here. So I have x y prime minus y equals x cosine of y over x. And now I'm going to just divide through by sine of y over x. Let me pull this up so you can see, see this a little bit better. This is the differential equation that we were just looking at. And I'm going to just add the y to the other side really quickly. And then I'm going to divide through by x. So I'll divide this one by x, and I'll divide this one by x. So when you're checking, when you're checking if your differential equation is homogeneous, you usually want to solve for y prime by itself, which is what I did here. Notice, by the way, I can cancel the x's right here. OK. Now the thing is that to test for homogeneous, what we have to do is imagine attaching t's. You remember that little trick? You put the t's next to every single x and every single y that you see in the whole entire right-hand side, and you look to see if they cancel out. And here they do. All of the t's that I just added in blue just cancel. And that means that this one is, in fact, homogeneous. It's, a whole, it's down here in the lower right box right here. This is a homogeneous differential equation. Basically, y prime is equal to some function f of x and y that doesn't change if you attach t's to those x's and y's. That's basically the, the idea. OK? We're almost out of time. Let me take just a, a couple more minutes to very quickly uh, go through the rest of these. Of course, you have to go back now and remember, well, how do you actually finish solving a homogeneous equation, right? So this is something to review. We've got seven days to, to review that. If you look at part D, I'm just going to go really fast and just say what the answers are, basically. Notice that part D is a second order equation. And the cosecant of x that you see on the right-hand side is not something that we know how to annihilate. So part D would be done using variation of parameters. Okay, so for part D, that's section 8.7.
variation of parameters. Um, part E is the trick question. Part E is a third order differential equation that we don't know how to annihilate the fraction on the right side. It's not going to be in the table. So this is a trick question. I couldn't put that question on the exam because it's not anywhere going to fit on our flow chart. A third order differential equation that we don't know how to annihilate the function would be something we didn't learn. Okay, so part E is kind of impossible. We can ex skip it basically. And finally, the last one, part F, you can think about it and remind, remind yourself briefly what a linear differential equation looks like. That one is linear. So we have a linear equation there, okay? So this was just a quick little exercise to practice um, identifying sort of the different types of differential equations and where this fits in the material from the semester. Okay. Um, I'll let you guys check the solutions to those and practice those along with all the other recommendations that I made earlier about studying for the exam. One last thing, guys, before we go today, um, I want to thank you guys very, very much from the bottom of my heart for taking this class and especially for sticking with it in spite of all of the craziness that has gone on since March. Um, I love my job. I love working with you guys. It's been a little tough this semester, but um, I have looked forward, even through Zoom, I have looked forward to getting together with you guys every Tuesday and Thursday to talk about this material that I absolutely love. And I don't get to do this unless people sign up and take my classes. And it means a lot to me that you guys did that. And I hope you feel good about what you've learned this semester. In spite of all the craziness, I think you've come a long way. I think you should be proud of sticking with it and learning a lot of math. That's gonna be hopefully very useful to you, whether you go into math or engineering or some other science, it should be, it should be really good for you. So um, if we were all together uh, in McCarthy Hall, I would take a class picture and give you guys a big group hug but um, we're just going to have to call it good from the virtual world this, this time around. Um, please keep in touch over the next seven days as you're studying. Let me know where you're feeling anxious, where your questions are, how I can help. And keep in touch if you want to, even into the future. I'll be glad to uh, give you advice and uh, certainly talk about math anytime. Uh, I really do love, love this stuff. So. Thank you guys again for being here and for being so good for the last 15 weeks. And uh, best wishes to you uh, to stay safe through this final exam period and beyond. And uh, we'll, we'll reconvene soon. I'm sure we'll get a good chance to, to talk again and let me know uh, what I can do to help uh, get you ready for the exam. Thank you all very much. Um, have a good rest of your day, good rest of your week and we'll be in touch, okay? Thanks a lot. I appreciate all of your nice comments as well. Thank you so much.